Hi, I'm Matthias, and this is the British Adams Revolver, specifically what collectors call a model of 1867, though the government labeled it the Mark II. Let's get a look at it in the light box. With an overall length of 11 inches and weighing at 2.4 pounds, this is an old world black powder large bore revolver. We have both single and double action operations. We're a gate loader with a rod ejector, and we can take six rounds of 450 atoms. Fun fact, I can easily take care of my 45 caliber Adams revolvers with the help of ballast all the four snakes. I like these guys because they are quick, handy, and I can go ahead and impregnate them with oil to make sure that the whole bore gets a layer of protection. They also have internal beads to keep even pressure down the barrel. Snag yours and more over at Ballastall. Make sure to tell them thank you for supporting the show. Overwhelmingly, however, our funding comes from you guys. No one pays enough in social media advertising, especially to a long format, deep history gun show like ours. So if you're enjoying the content, please consider coming over to Patreon or Player and making it possible. Support begins at just $1 a month, which gets you early episode access and our once an episode podcast update on how the show is going. Bonus, we read y'all's letters. Today's episode is of course focused on the Centerfire Cartridge Adams Revolver. However, this inherits a lot from the percussion era. Confusingly, most of it comes from a different man also named Adams. Robert Adams, born in the village of Marlden, Devon. He was at least a junior as he shared his father's name who lived as a blacksmith. Unfortunately, beyond that, most of his early life remains undiscovered by the sources available to me. What is known is that by 1850, he was associated with George and John Dean. The Deans claimed to have been in business since the 1700s, particularly in the field of metal goods. They were essentially retailers of tools, uh, hardware men, ironmongers, cutlers. As part of this endeavor, by 1844, they had already partnered with gun makers to supply firearms to their customers. In 1851, however, they would go a step further with Robert Adams, who that same year filed patent for this, what would become one of the most influential firearms patents, especially in the British market. This covered what was then commonly called a self-cocking revolver, though now we would say it's a double action. This did not, however, provide for single action or manual cocking. It also included a manually set hammer block in the form of a flat spring on the side of the frame. Most importantly, it laid claim to producing the frame and barrel as a single piece of shaped metal. This produced the strongest possible construction and meant a great many years later designs had to pay royalties to Adams. The resulting firearm, by the way, looks like this, a black powder percussion arm chambering five shots. The Adams revolver's double action operation and saw handle grip became something of a standard for British handguns going forward. Adams' revolver was enough to warrant the formation of a new firm, Dean, Adams, and Dean. It's likely the Deans were financiers, with Adams as both the inventor and the producer of the arms. The 1851 competed directly with Colt's latest and greatest, the Model 1851, which we've thankfully covered in some detail. While it saw military sales, Colt was largely kept out of the British market because of his self-reliance and independence. You see, the Adams revolver wasn't just produced by Adams. Frankly, he probably only undertook certain limited operations on his own pistols. Instead, various parts were jobbed out to a myriad of specialty small workshops in Britain, who then either sent the parts to Adams, or for many, finished the revolvers and sold them directly, each time paying a royalty to the inventor's company. This system means a single successful design could generate a profit for many businesses, something Colt did not offer to the British gunsmiths when he attempted his invasion from America. The battle of these two 1851s is certainly a story we'll cover in detail another day. However, this fight between single and double action only principles was interrupted in 1854 by one Lieutenant Frederick B.E. Beaumont. Born October 22nd of 1833 in Darfield, South Yorkshire, he was educated at the Harrow School before enlisting in the Royal Engineers. Going just beyond our date of 1854, he would serve in the Crimean War, notably as one of few officers to be with the Turkish forces. 
Beaumont's relationship to Adams is sadly unknown. However, it does appear that they were working together on a revolver by the year of 1854. Beaumont's patent, however, was filed in early 1855. Here he claimed an action that was both hammer cocked and self-cocking at the whim of the shooter, what we'd call today a triple action revolver. Features include a slotted pawl, which is what he called a driver, which either pressed on a notch in the hammer during double action fire, or was dragged along by a hook on the hammer breast during single action operation. This is also made possible by a spring-powered overhand sear. This system also includes a rising cylinder stop integrated into the trigger. The patent was, by the way, purchased by Robert Adams. Despite the 1855 filing date, I suspect this was in the works the previous year because of a complimentary Adams patent in 1854. This features a revolver very similar to the following Beaumont, at least externally. The hammer spur and trigger position tell us it was drawn off an existing triple action design. Adam's patent, however, only covers a swing up loading lever, a sliding manual safety, which keeps the cylinder misaligned so that the hammer cannot fall on a cap, and a captive retractable central arbor. Combining the two, we get what's now known as the Model 1854 Beaumont Adams, though that's more of a collector's term. This is still a five shot solid frame revolver built on the Adams patent. However, it also has features from Adams' new patent and Beaumont's excellent lock work. It was this design that would first be purchased by British Ordnance during the Crimean War. Although actual combat would go to the much more numerous Colt 1851s that had been bought up. However, following purchases of the initial Beaumont Adams, Ordnance was now curious what could be had in their domestic market. Ultimately, some 2,300 Dean and Adams revolvers would be purchased in 1855. These came in two calibers, with the majority being in 54 bore, nominally 0.442 inch. These were essentially a large pool of trials revolvers for experiments with various mounted and specialty troops. Various trials and purchases would carry on until 1858, over which time the Beaumont Adams saw another change. The addition of James Kerr's patented loading lever, a lovely ram that thankfully stacks power with an easier pull. Kerr was also an associate of Robert Adams, we'll cover him more in detail some other day though. The Beaumont Adams revolver with a Kerr rammer is the most common configuration in which to find these antiques today. Several thousand were purchased by ordnance again in 442. During the sale of these arms to the government, Robert Adams would break off his association with the Deans, at least officially in the business title. It's known that John Dean took up shares in Adam's next venture, so likely there's no bad blood. Instead, this seems to have been a decision for the future. To rewind just a bit, just ahead of the Crimean War, and with growing concern throughout, a push was begun to form a large, modernized government arms factory, what would later be realized as the Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield. This represented a significant threat to the London and Birmingham gunmakers, who could not afford to compete with the oncoming tide of innovation. Samuel Colt and other Americans had been championing machine-based fabrication with repeatable operations that would result in much more interchangeable parts and much lower costs overall. Small problem, this scale of operation requires a lot of upfront expense in order to produce one core product that must be sold in large numbers to recoup your initial losses. It seems that Robert Adams, along with some wise investors, got the idea, and in 1856 launched the London Armory Company Limited. He was contracted to serve as the manager, and his new company took on his patents and available shops and equipment. Though, capital was expended to secure American manufacturing equipment as well. Revolvers were not the first order of business for this new entity. Instead, they targeted production of the 1853 Enfield rifled musket, the hope being to beat out the government push for home manufacture, providing a cost-efficient alternative. This, however, did not work out and warrants its own story someday. Instead, they ended up mostly trading in Adams revolvers. While commercially exceptional, their investment needed mass production, but in terms of government sales, the LAC delivered only about 5,000 more of the Beaumont Adams. Overall, wartime sales of the Colt far outnumbered even post-war sales of the Beaumont Adams. That's because ultimately the British Army decided that revolvers as a whole weren't really suitable for the service. 
that may seem unusual, especially if we consider the alternative was a single shot large bore percussion pistol, these actually remained army standard all the way until the late 1870s, not for lack of technological competition, but because the handgun itself was considered unimportant. The British Army was one of very strict doctrine, where each soldier served his role to the end. Artillerymen were meant to man the guns. Infantry had their rifle and the bayonet. The officers were to command, so much so that there were arguments against any pistol or carbine for them to carry at all. The cavalry were trained for the saber. A single shot from a pistol was about as much concession as they would make to independent operation. The five-shot, fairly low-powered, hefty and complicated Beaumont Adams could not manage to break this conservatism. So despite various trials, it was never adopted by the army. However, it did find favor with the navy. The existing stock, uh, plus a few odd purchases, which I don't have documentation for, fully satisfied the Navy's needs. Adams and the London Armory Company weren't going to get a large government contract for their wheel guns, so they had to compete for the private market, like uh, civilian or officer private purchases, alongside of everyone else. Robert Adams' successes afforded him a comfortable home with a large family, nurse, and cook. However, in July of 1858, he left the London Armoury Company. There is no official reason given for his departure, though it has been speculated that he was upset over a lack of interest in developing some new revolver designs. Just months before he left, a patent was published under the name John Adams, someone almost more of a mystery than a man. Researchers believe they have identified him as another Devon-born English gunsmith. Many sources claim that he was brother to Robert Adams. But that John Adams seems to have predeceased their father, who was gone by the early 1840s. This John Adams is likely a cousin, but how close of one is still disputed. Chamberlain and Taylorson believe his birth to have been in 1828 in or near St. Mary's Parish, Kingscriswell, supposedly son of a carpenter named Robert Adams. So unless the grandparents were bad at naming children, I'm not thinking first cousin. John Adams seems to have appeared in London in the mid-1850s, with a known Dalston address in 1857. Cousin John had apparently been employed by or contracted with the London Armoury Company, during which time he developed several unique inventions pertaining to revolvers. His 1857 patent covers a wide array of features, a floating firing pin set in the frame, a round sliding safety which fit inside the recoil shield, a very uniquely arranged lockwork specifically designed to make use of circular cutting tools. A care-style compound rammer was fitted under the barrel such that it could retain the central arbor. He also patented a two-piece frame assembly. This allowed the use of smaller stock metal and made machine operations much simpler. It also kept the front and rear of the arbor in one of the assemblies, making for more rigid construction despite being a split frame. While I said some believe Robert left the London Armoury Company for failing to pursue his and his cousin's innovations, I suspect it's more likely that he saw the writing on the wall with the establishment of the government's own manufacturer at Enfield. John, of course, followed Robert. Now, they could produce whatever they liked. However, disaster struck repeatedly. Operating from 76 King William Street under the name R. Adams, Robert made a very costly mistake. In 1859, a rifle barrel supplied to the Victoria Rifle Volunteers at Kilburn burst at the range. Once informed, Robert took 30 of his own rifles from the unit's armory. These were then sent to the London Proof House, where all of them withstood proofing. Small problem, though. The Proof Act of 1855 stated that this should have happened before their sale, and Robert Adams was therefore prosecuted and fined. Some relief might have come with his 1860 inheritance of three houses at rent and two acres of land following his father's death. However, it wasn't enough to offset both failing sales and high costs of production. In 1863, the London Armoury Company defaulted on its lease for a factory on Henry Street. Robert Adams was obligated to now cover the remainder of that lease. In 1864, he attempted another revolver patent, however, it was refused for lacking novelty. That same year, a popular opinion letter in the field derided wealthy, fancy revolver makers, all but naming Robert Adams, 
who were charging over double the rate of equally capable handmade designs, the excess profits obviously going towards their lavish lives. While that might have been the case on the outside, in December of that same year, Robert was ordered into bankruptcy, which was settled in the courts in April of 1865. He sold off his various interests to cover his creditors and moved his business to Pall Mall before closing his shop in 1866. He did file further patents for long gun features in 1867, but it does not seem he met success again. He would pass away in September of 1870, a victim of an infection following an amputation of a leg. By this time, however, Cousin John had already achieved his own place in British handgun history. But of course, we're going to have to rewind a bit back to 1861. That year, John Adams paid the fees to renew his 1857 patent, and he filed a new one to boot. It included his own design for both a centerfire cartridge and a method for loading and unloading it as well. This was done by fitting the cylinder with a rear cap, which could be slid sideways to the left when unlocked. Then singular cartridges could be loaded or unloaded on the right. It's also worth noting his two-piece frame was modified slightly. Now the cylinder is fully enclosed with no opening at the bottom. Instead, the grip section along with the trigger group is attached separately. This is very much like the modern AR upper and lower receiver. It's worth mentioning that he hedged his bets by making the design capable of being breech loading or muzzle loading. This was a real concern at the time, as metallic cartridge breech loading wasn't entirely ironed out yet. With Robert Adams crumbling, John Adams sought out his own fortunes in 1864, forming Adams Patent Small Arms Company Limited, with himself as the managing director. Now this is a bit of a mouthful, so I'm going to carry forward by just calling it APSAC. Share capital was set at £10,000 but was never fully called up. The chairman was an attorney named John Wilcoxon Ruth. The business was located at 391 Strand. This was a four-story house with a workshop only 15 by 47 feet at best. One of APSAC's first endeavors was to sell a breech-loading conversion rifle to the British service. We know in hindsight, however, that the Snyder would become the initial inexpensive option in this regard, with the Martini Henry following on as the new made dedicated breech loader. Testing for a new rifle, however, opened up another avenue in British small arms. When Remington sent over their rolling block long gun, they also included a handgun. In the US, this would become the model of 1865. For the British, however, it reopened the question of how long they could hold on to a single shot muzzle loading pistol. Once again in 1866, John Adams filed a revolver patent, better to be prepared in case the service changed its mind. Again, we see a two piece firearm and a further refinement of his compounded rammer set underneath the barrel. More importantly, however, this patent covers specialty machinery, which was meant to quickly cut the frame in a rapid, repeatable fashion. The hope was to produce with at least partial machine operation. The small parts, however, were still produced with the usual jigs and files or sourced from the trade. The resulting revolver was branded the Adams New Patent Improved Double Action Revolver. Being in regulation bore, it's likely he was seeking further government sales or at least officers' purchases. John Adams' combined patents granted him the ability to produce the 1866 in either muzzle loading or center fire, but all known examples are only set up for the former. It seems likely that by the time of production, he was already on to a better idea for hitting central primers. In the meantime, however, the government was still shopping. In 1867, comparison firing was undertaken, another attempt to interest the armed forces in cartridge handguns. Testing was also done at RSAF Enfield. This time, the rolling block pistol was up against what is now believed to have been a Merwin and Bray cup-primed front-loading metallic cartridge revolver. While neither saw adoption, it did spark more interest towards both centerfire revolvers and breech-loading in handguns. There were also limited trials of a Spanish conversion system for the CARE single action percussion revolver. This too was disappointing, but especially after the successful Snyder conversion program, warranted some more attention. At that time, there were roughly 7,000 Beaumont Adams still in service or in storage, and even more Colts. Uh, being able to recycle these assets might save on expenses. John Adams took the challenge, uh, purchasing an old Dean and Adams percussion of five shot revolver, just like the ones in service, and modifying it to centerfire. 
While I don't have an image of this trials pistol, it was largely built on his 1861 patent, though chambering the then available 380 revolver cartridge. This was tested at Enfield in August with John Adams present, where it earned fair praise. However, the loading system, again, where a breech piece was slid over in order to expose the right hand side of the cylinder, was disliked for being confounding and slow. A half cock position on the hammer was also felt to be unacceptable in terms of being a replacement for the manual uh, hammer block safety or the manual safety on the side that indexed the cylinder out of position. The program was continued and even apparently received help from Colonel Edouard Monnier Boxer superintendent of the Royal Laboratory at Woolridge. Boxer had laid patent claims to various cartridge features then in development. We saw his wrapped brass foil rifle cartridge in our Martini Henry episodes. However, he's also known for first patenting a particular style of center fire primer, still the most popular with hand loaders today because the anvil was set inside the primer itself instead of the case. Now there is some controversy about how much Boxer actually invented versus what he borrowed from others that they had not taken to the patent office before he could get there. Regardless, as far back as 1858, Boxer was on record as preferring rear-loading metallic cartridge technology with an appreciation for the Pinfire Leffa show. John Adams' revolver likely satisfied Boxer's own conditions, so he supposedly took on the task of designing an ideal cartridge for this conversion. The result was 450 Adams, a black powder centerfire metallic cased cartridge. The bullet diameter now made use of the existing bore. The initial version used an iron rim riveted to the drawn brass case. By December of 1867, it appears that John Adams had further improved his revolver, or revolvers, because what emerged would be essentially two designs. The first was an improved conversion of the original Beaumont Adams percussion revolvers. Five shot now chambering the 450 Adams metallic breech loading cartridge. These were almost immediately adopted by the Metropolitan Police Force, but the War Department was still undecided. A clone of the police contract and a slightly modified example, frankly I'm not sure exactly how it was modified, were sent to the Ordnance Select Committee where they were compared against what was at the time the most recent sample revolver to be considered for the service. It looked a lot like this one, a Frank Hot breech loading metallic cartridge design imported by J.H. Crane. At the time, it was a rim fire, though this example is center fire. A modification of this revolver would actually go on to be adopted in Austria Hungary. Adam's conversions were cheaper and apparently favorable enough, though there had been some concern about ditching the slide bolt safety. Adam solved this, however, by using the ejector rod of all things. We'll explain how that works in a minute. So, what all went into the conversion? Well, the cylinder was discarded and a new one was made and fitted in place. A plate was dovetailed into the rear of the opening in the frame, allowing for the attachment of a loading gate, and a groove was milled in the frame to permit ammunition to fit in said loading gate. The spring safety was removed and its attachment points filled in. The care rammer was removed and its lugs reshaped accordingly. If this was one of the earlier model 1854 rammers, the lug was actually reinforced. A new press button was fitted to work with a notch cut in the arbor. A linear ejector with housing was fitted in the rammer's stead. And a half cock notch was cut on the hammer. The resulting conversion, as later adopted, was stamped with a fresh serial number unrelated to its original, plus a fresh proofing. These revolvers were also refinished and in the process their original markings were all but lost. In July of 1868, the committee tested a Beaumont Adams firing some 200 rounds, then gave it to John Adams for conversion, after which it was tested for 765 rounds. In addition to being simpler to load, better sealed against the elements, and permitting use of much hardier ammunition, the new pistol and cartridge provided significantly more penetration. They happily noted that at 60 yards, the percussion pistol only penetrated 1.9 inches of elm board. The new metallic cartridge managed 3.45 inches. An official recommendation for adoption soon followed. However, in September, the committee was informed that funds were not available for both a new conversion and all of the required changeover of ammunition. Even so, the Secretary of State to uh, British Service approved the adoption of John Adams' conversion on November 20th of 1868. Scrounging for additional funds, it was found that the Snyder conversion program hadn't actually used up all of its projected budget. So a plan was made to slowly introduce the new Adams conversion as funds were available. 
At adoption, this became the pistol, revolver, Dean and Adams converted to breech loader Mark I. They were very clear in their titles. Finally approved of in December of 1868, it was published in the February 1869 list of changes. Boxer's ammo was also approved in December, becoming the cartridge, small arm, ball, breech loading boxer for Dean and Adams converted breech loading pistol Mark I. Woo! Now, all of this was still focused on the Navy's need for revolvers. The Army still didn't care. So a very mild program was begun with plans to convert perhaps 700 Beaumonts a year, at least at first. This would eventually work through roughly 7,000 muzzleloaders, all Beaumont Adams, of course. The Colts would be turned over to the Coast Guard. They were not getting converted. Though Colt did offer some loose competition. They submitted their own cartridge conversions along the way. The first was the muzzle loading third, but this wasn't ideal, especially because ramming a cartridge home from the front of the pistol was especially unwelcome in an era where experiments were still being done with exploding bullets. Even so, a public comparison between the Thur and what was a commercially fresh-made Adams breech loader, somewhat unfairly not a conversion, resulted in Colt's defeat, both in accuracy and in penetration. Apparently, the War Department still purchased 250 Thur cylinders for testing. These seem to have largely ended up in Australian police service some years later. Now, about that new-made John Adams revolver I just mentioned. While the conversion was being tested and eventually accepted, Adams filed for another patent, one that covered all of his novel ideas. Applying in October of 1867, this covered the loading groove in the frame, a hinged loading gate to match, and the unique ejector rod, which again we'll see closer in a moment. Most notably, it covered two methods for locking that rod, a rotating lever that collectors now call the Type A, and a push button more like the Mark I conversion, known as the Type B. Fun fact, it's believed that the spring biased gate in that patent forced Colt's patent firearms to change the design of their next breech loading conversion. Their agent in Britain, Baron, Baron von Oppen, attempted to negotiate a royalty payment for the gate in 1870. He did, however, also try to obscure who was asking, but Adams likely figured it out and denied them access to the patent. This apparently forced changes to the Richards conversion, I suppose meaning its initial inclusion of a fairly complicated coil spring detent for the loading gate. I do not, however, have the means to confirm this story. Now, Von Alpen's initial letter to Colt on this matter in 1870 suggested that APSAC, John Adams' company, was in a bad way financially. And at the time, that was quite likely true. The 1868 adoption had yielded pitifully few actual sales to the government, as the revolver was still Navy only and not a priority. So they would have to parlay its adoption into commercial sales. But of course, not everyone had a Beaumont laying around ready to be converted, meaning brands making new guns had to be made out of the 1867 patent. These, and frankly all subsequent models, were marketed under the name Adams New Patent Double Action Central Fire Breech Loading Revolver. It's likely the new patent was meant to purposely confuse the John Adams revolver and the more famous Robert Adams design of yesteryear. Now I happen to have one of these new made revolvers right here, so let's get a closer look. All right, we have what is actually on the surface a very obviously British revolver. The styling that was inherited down from the 1851 Adams and the earlier Beaumonts is very apparent all the way up through the Webleys. Now, what have we got? Well, we have the barrel and upper frame integral as one piece. The lower frame is a separate piece attached through with these screws. Now, that is not something that you want to disassemble frequently. Um, it's not really designed to be a takedown feature, it's more of a construction feature. Uh, this is a single action, and then pull with a nice slight trigger, or double action, keep pulling the trigger until that hammer goes back and then falls, and it has a manually rebounded position. There is no safety click, as you might hear on a Colt, instead the rebound position is our safety position. Well, at least in terms of the lock work. There's an actual safety safety on this revolver, though it's a bit of a hidden feature. Loading and unloading happens through this singular gate. And uh, there's obviously a groove cut there that tells you where to be. Unfortunately, when you index the cylinder, there is no positive relationship between the position of the cylinder and the loading and unloading port. Let me show you. 
I have to manually index to each point. You notice you're not hearing any clicks. And if I backtrack onto the hand, it definitely doesn't align. It's seemingly random in its alignment, which means that you must visually index every time. There is no tactile feedback, no auditory feedback. Now the gate does, by the way, detent into the closed position. So if we loaded our six singular rounds, shot the gun and we want to eject, well, let's talk about this ejector rod. Now, first off, this guy can't move forward or back unless we rotate it around and therefore can use it as our ejector rod, moving forward and back with ease, although manually operated the whole way, no spring assist. The other thing that we can do is partially insert the rod. I like to go until I see that little detent appear then rotate it back around and gently withdraw it. If you do it right, you should feel a click and it should lock into place, although not perfectly because this has some age. Let me see if I can get to that spot again. There we go, right there. Now it should hold, but this gun's been forced over the years by people who didn't know any better. In this position, it serves as a safety. So the hammer is rebounded and it cannot be fully cocked back because the cylinder is not free to rotate enough to let the hand go as high. You guys get the idea. Lock the cylinder, lock the action. Now this means that we shouldn't be able to get past our rebounded position, yes, but also it's supposed to misalign the cylinder in such a way that the uh, firing pin will not reach any of the center fire primers. Some examples have shown that this is not always the case, but that was the best hope. Now, I don't think of it as a truly uh, excellent safety. It certainly is an unusual choice, but in order to free it and ready the gun for fire, you have to rotate down about 90 degrees, get this guy forward, and then lock it back into position. The other function of this particular ejector rod, because it is very multifunctional, is to prevent the arbor from fully escaping on disassembly. So if we press this arbor release button, that drives our cross pin such that we can allow our arbor to escape and our cylinder to fall free. And yet, as you can see, this guy's not coming all the way out of the gun. It's a very good retention system to keep this into simply two pieces for rough and ready cleaning. The cylinder is fairly unremarkable. Uh, we have uh, recesses for each, our rims on our six cartridges. In this case, there's two holes set in the ratchet teeth. These are normally filled with flush ground screws. In this case, they're gone. I don't even see a sign of threading and I'm not sure why, though it does kind of show us that this is a separate piece because we can see that occluded hole down in there in this case. So nice little find that's not mentioned in the literature. On the side, we have standard cylinder stops. At the front, there's nothing fancy going on. If I tip this guy over, you may wonder about the cylinder's length compared to that little 450 Adams cartridge. Don't forget, the original version of this gun was a conversion, a five-shot conversion, that took from the percussion 442 bore, let's say. So if we think of this as a uh, ball with a charge behind it, it takes up this much space, and then this would have been some room for your percussion cap and the milling around which, and sort of that cup-shaped back and the thickness that you would need. Uh, when he, when I should say John Adams, went to the conversion system, he just used existing frames for army service. And since he had set up his machinery to cut cylinders for those existing frames, it seems that he went ahead and used the same machinery to make his new made guns, which means they ended up with unnecessarily long cylinders, unnecessarily long and heavy frames. Probably not the best idea, but it seems to have paid off in one regard, which is that under testing, this was found to have better velocity and penetration than the service cartridges that, or the service muzzle loaders rather. The muzzle loaders theoretically had the same charge and generally same weight of projectile, but because this is set so far back, there's more room for expansion before the bullet clears what is the opening at the front of the cylinder, and that's where we lose a lot of power to cylinder gap. This gave us a little more power before we hit that bleed off point, so kind of a neat feature if an accidental one. Now, sadly, these solid frame revolvers aren't really meant to be disassembled often. It's a bit of a pain in the bum. So that's why I made Bruno do it for our animation. Loading the atoms is straightforward. Simply draw the hammer back slightly in order to set it in the rebound position. Then lift up the gate, which spring detents into place, and insert six 450 atoms cartridges. There is no mechanical assist. We must visually align the cylinder to the loading groove each time. Once full, just snap the gate down. Looking again at the hammer, it's powered by a large V-spring, which keeps it constantly biased towards the next primer. Presently, it's held back, however, by the sear, a carefully shaped piece of hardened metal whose upper extension meets one of the two notches in the hammer breast. The sear is biased towards the hammer by its own flat spring. 
For single action operation, we just have to cock the hammer back manually and release it to rest at full cock. Pulling the trigger tips the sear, freeing the hammer to fall, thereby discharging the cartridge. The trigger, by the way, is carefully shaped so that it serves several roles. In double action, we merely pull it to cock the hammer back and drop it on the next cartridge. When we release the trigger, this V-spring is responsible for returning it forward. The trigger is also responsible for raising the hand. This piece is biased towards the rear of the cylinder by its attached flat spring. This is shared with a strut that we'll see in a moment. As the trigger raises the hand, it presses into one of the ratchet teeth at the rear of the cylinder, in turn rotating into one of six positions. It also keeps lateral pressure on the same ratchet tooth at the moment of fire, thereby preventing counter rotation. Over rotation is prevented by the cylinder stop, a projection off the top of the trigger which rises into place as the trigger is pulled or dragged along by the hammer. Also attached to the trigger is this strut. It's held in place by the hand's pin and shares its flat spring, though in this case it's biased to the rear into the hammer's breast. Pulling the trigger shoves the strut into the hammer, where it catches on a notch and shoves the hammer way back before slipping free and allowing the hammer to fall. A hole in the strut meets with a hook on the hammer's breast. When manually cocked for single action operation, the hammer drags the strut along. This in turn brings the trigger, hand, and stop into their correct positions. When the trigger is pulled, the strut clears the hammer just as the sear is depressed. To unload, we'll first rebound the hammer again and open the gate. Just rotate the ejector 90 degrees, freeing it from its detented position, and manually snap it back to eject each casing. Once more, there is no spring assist, we must push and pull all on our own. Once she's empty, close it up and rotate the rod. Now, back to Othias. The new made John Adams revolvers were also shown to the War Department. 15 were fired at Enfield in May of 1868. That's before the Mark I was actually adopted. While it performed well, it doesn't seem to have been a priority, as the conversion process was less expensive, and thankfully slow, or at least from the government's perspective, thankfully slow. Once again, the Army wasn't interested, and the Navy had limited need. And I should point out that at the time, this wasn't exclusive to the British Empire. Many nations were dawdling on adopting breech-loading sidearms despite all the interest in rifles. If you look at most martial revolvers, we see cartridge loaders after 1870. That's likely thanks in part to observing the Franco-Prussian War. This 1870 conflict between France and Germany made practical a number of innovations which, for those with foresight, heralded the future of warfare. Two notable features include the French use of total war, and the waning of cavalry's direct combat power. The combination of breech-loading small arms, faster artillery, and on some occasions the mitrailleuse had a withering effect on the cavalry charge. However, cavalry still found a role in reconnaissance, communications, delaying actions, and harassment of enemy units. This change in priority disfavored the saber and the lance, but carbines and pistols proved very effective. The English finally took note about eight years later. In the meantime, however, the Navy did need some more revolvers. No conversion system for the Colt was found to be acceptable, nor was there much interest in maintaining two cartridges in service. So the 1867 commercial model B-Type was adopted in February of 1872, making it the pistol, revolver, Adams, central fire, breech loading. Also more succinctly known as the Mark II. By the way, when the superintendent of the RSAF Enfield submitted the revolver to be sealed as pattern for all future contracts, he actually referred to it as a Dean and Adams in the accompanying letter. No wonder these names still cause confusion today. The military and commercial 1867B revolvers are identical except for their markings. The Marshall examples have a Roman numeral II applied to the left front of the frame. The Mark I's, however, do not have a Roman numeral at all. Both generally have a WD for War Department, and they should all be stamped with the month and year of their acceptance, just ahead of the grips on the left side. All right, with that much covered, I suppose we can take a moment and get a look at what it's like to actually handle this guy.
Honestly, better than I expected. Now, being both a commercial and official sidearm, the Mark II can be found in a variety of configurations. Barrels are generally like this one here, just under six inches in length, though a smattering of four and four and a half inch examples can be found out there. Various uh, platings, engravings, and other fine features also turn up infrequently. Production of the Mark I and the Mark II is hard to pin down. The Mark I could have encompassed up to 7,000 units. That is really generous, though. John Adams began serializing his own commercial examples of converted Beaumont revolvers at number 7001, leaving room for the potential range of the naval stores. The highest known government serial, though, is 5788. A rough estimate of Mark II's hovers around 3000 units. Both of these numbers, however, are speculative and based on several assumptions. While the cost of the Mark I conversion is unknown to me. The Mark II cost ordinance two pounds, 19 shillings. Now, when the Mark I conversion was adopted, it was branded non-interchangeable because being made off of a black powder frame meant that there was no hope of reworking every single example with machine tooling in order to give, bring them all into line. The Mark II, however, was happily branded interchangeable thanks to John Adams' machine tooling for at least some of the operations. Unfortunately, in reality, parts interchangeability between known examples today remains very low. Collectors have even attempted to identify the thread pattern used in these particular revolvers. It wasn't Whitworth or British Association or any other known industry standard. It appears to have been Adam's own creation. And even then, it wasn't consistent internal to itself. Screws may vary within one gun. Strangely, this wouldn't prove to be the first problem found in the Adams revolvers in service, though. Experience with both the Mark I and the Mark II revealed that the ejector rod wasn't as robust as it could be. Being constantly exposed and fairly lightly constructed, it tended to bend or even break off, so an improved model was quickly developed. John Adams filed patent in 1872 for this somewhat unique solution much like the parent ejector, but pivoting lower on the frame, likely a necessity given the barrel was integral and therefore wouldn't take a collar. Like the parent, the Adam stores the ejector rod inside the central arbor when not in use. This original model also featured a spring-powered detent. Paired with the existing revolver, we get what's known as the Adams Mark III. I happen to have one right here, so let's go ahead and put it in the light box. With an overall length of 11 inches, this is very comparable to its precursor. However, the examples I've been able to measure come in at around 2.3 pounds, a slight savings on weight. Of course, we still have a six round capacity and still chamber the 450 Adams black powder center fire cartridge. The lock work internally is still the same. Sealed in August of 1872, orders seem to have begun flowing with some overlap with the previous models. The collector's designation, by the way, is the model of 1872. Now, uh, let's go ahead and get a closer look at how this differs from the Mark II. Comparing the two, there's not a lot of difference until you look at the ejectors and the front of the frame. So this guy's much slimmer thanks to this uh, changeover, and we don't have the same retention system for the arbor, no, this has all been cut away. Now, some of the shape was probably a carryover from the conversion process, and therefore the milling that was put into the Mark II, which shares a lot more with the conversion revolver. I'm sorry I don't have one of those here today. I just didn't have the luck of borrowing one. On the Mark III, we've got a nice flush modern fit, and of course, this new ejector. So let's get a look at how that might work. To unload our revolver, we'll simply flip up our gate, and then we'll pull forward on this rod, Flip her over and listen for the detent. Hear that click? That's very satisfying. Might be a little hard to make out, but you can actually see that detent position right there. Click, click, very positive. And of course, from here, we can eject our casings. Although I will say I find that I keep accidentally running into the Arbor release button, which is now on this side. Uh, press that to pull your arbor free, which by the way is no longer retained. Uh, but that little guy just always seems to get right in the way if I don't have this just so. There we go. So kick it out, kick it out, kick it out. Now you might have, if you're very eagle-eyed, noticed that there is a difference here. Very slight, but very important. Let me show you. If we roll this guy until we hear the click of the hand, 
hear that click of the hand snapping over its ratchet tooth, then roll back, we're in alignment with our loading and unloading port. This is a distinct difference from the previous gun. As a matter of fact, let me go ahead and show you that here. See how high set that was? Nowhere near alignment with the hand. Now all they did, oh boy, it's so hard to hear the hand on this gun for some reason. I'm not sure why, but well, probably because it doesn't have a very strong spring. There it goes. See, it's actually aligning to the same position. This guy just went ahead and put the groove where it should have been all along. That means that we can kind of roll back to catch the right position each time for loading and unloading. It's much faster and much more tactile. This feature was actually commented on by Colt's agent Von Alpen when they developed the 1878 double action revolver, which was based on competition from this Adams and other designs at that time. Now, this feature I don't often see mentioned in the literature, but I find to be very remarkable because it's a big ergonomic gain. So again, eject and eject. Excellent. This is much better thought out than its precursor. Now, I don't think we'll need an animation on this one, so let's go ahead and get it straight into May's hands. And that walked forward just a little bit there. Now, the Mark I through III production relationship is a bit of a nightmare, except in states are all over the place, and production seems to have had a fair bit of overlap. Perhaps they were using the serial number as an assembly number? Some Mark III's even have acceptance dates months before their official adoption. It's likely the general overlap stemmed from delays in Marshall purchases after each model was in production. Adams, however, wanted as many sales as possible and likely pushed each out the door for private purchasers. That would mean while selling the new Mark III, you've still contracted for a Mark II to the Navy, at least until they agree to change that over. And boy, did they stall. The first order for 500 Mark III's was delayed until January of 1873. Overall, it's estimated between 7 and 8,000 Mark II and Mark III revolvers in total were provided to the War Department. Total sales of all John Adams' new made revolvers, that includes the scant few 1866 percussion guns as a matter of fact, is estimated at 17,000, a seemingly small number for a very prominent name in history. You may feel John Adams found a way to make some more money when I tell you that there is a Mark IV, however, it's not terribly exciting. Functional problems in the Mark I conversions resulted in some modification. The hand was reshaped and strengthened, and the flat spring that powers it received the same boost. The sears were also strengthened, though I'm unsure if this was dimensionally or with a different heat treatment. The arbor latch button screw was also made more secure, 
broadened and no longer countersunk. The Director of Naval Ordnance approved these changes on the 20th of August 1872, so about the time that the Mark III showed up on the scene. A modified example prepared by John Adams was sealed in December. To date, the Mark IV remains a bit of a mystery. No examples are known to be marked with a Roman numeral IV, and it appears the intent was to modify the Mark I's that were on hand as needed. By the nature of the changes, the only external difference would be that ejector screw. But from study, collectors seem to have found a mixture of features, and we know that the sealed pattern didn't always match production. Even for me, I'm not sure what constitutes a Mark IV in practicality. I'd probably have to dismantle a dozen or more Mark I's in order to figure it out. So with all that covered, what about service for these two particular wheel guns? Well, for nearly a decade, these guys were largely shipboard. There's some small chance of service during the Third Anglo-Ashanti War, perhaps with the Royal Marines. Alternatively, the Adams was a common enough purchase for British officers, who could have carried them to any of the 1870s conflicts, though. Each of those stories, however, would have to come one by one from personal records. As far as arming a force, the Adams actually saw more utility with police than with military for a few short years. The very first contract was with the Metropolitan Police, as we mentioned earlier. They were likely seeking better arms due to their repeated conflicts with the Fenian devotees. Roughly 700 were purchased and distributed to 63 police stations in London. These arrived starting in August of 1868, well ahead of naval use. We know that they were Mark I's because they were issued with 10 rounds of ammunition, divisible by 5, it tells us it's a 5-shot cylinder. It was also the first cartridge revolver of the Canadian Northwest Mounted Police. Formed in 1873, they put in orders for Snyder carbines and the latest pattern of English regulation revolver. What they got were 330 Adams Mark I's, which arrived at Fort Dufferin in July. Unfortunately, they were trashed. Poor packaging and a long trip meant the gun suffered from bent ejectors, crack stocks, and cylinders that didn't always want to revolve. Honestly, it's mostly the problems that we hear that led to the adoption of the Mark IV pattern. Commissioner George Arthur French was very upset. He declared the lot to be of very inferior quality and almost untrustworthy. Unfortunately, there was no time to get a hold of a replacement. Western Canada was not developed and transportation of equipment was largely limited to the summer months. They would have to wait at least a year to try again. Ultimately, 330 Mark III's were shipped in exchange for the Mark I's. However, attrition had taken effect and recalling the Mark I's was likely to be a nightmare. So when the Mark III arrived with four units stolen in transit, they called it even. Canadian Northwest Mounted Police Adams Mark I's have no special markings that I know of, but the Mark III's did. $40.97 were paid to an Ottawa gunsmith to stamp CMP in a circle on each of the lot. The Mark II was rather short-lived, with the uh, Mark III seeing official adoption just behind it, so it tends to be the least found in other odd places, though apparently it turned up in the hands of New South Wales Police as early as 1871. It was also used in small numbers by an expedition of the Royal Engineers, assisting a commission in defining the boundary between the US and Canada. And while the Adams was in service, the army began to slowly thaw. In 1872, the commander-in-chief of the forces, Prince George, called for a new pistol, either a revolver or a breech loader. This was in order to finally replace the now much hated percussion cap muzzle loading single shot. Several possible designs were submitted through the RSAF Enfield. But the matter fizzled. Efforts were renewed in 1874. A War Office Committee was formed, testing a variety of designs including the Naval Adams and a Tranter 1868 sporting an impressive 8-inch barrel. They became distracted, however, with a double-barreled pistol chambering a 577 cartridge. Apparently, a year or more was spent trying to make that one work without being a god-awful nightmare to actually carry and shoot. This thing actually went to trials, but no examples nor documentation of what they looked like is known to myself, nor even to Jonathan Ferguson at the Royal Armouries who I've been pestering about this. I have a vague suspicion that they had something to do with the later Lancaster pistol, but that was nearly a decade later. Ultimately, the army surrendered their program, and in November of 1877, the British Secretary for the State for War approved the Navy's Mark III for issue to staff sergeants and trumpeters of the cavalry and lancers in general. 
This and further decisions may have come about due to apprehensions about the then ongoing Russo-Turkish War. The British Empire was carefully watching Russia's victories and worrying about the balance of regional power. In December of 1877, an improved 450 cartridge was announced. A new fine grain rifle powder was introduced. Also, priming had swapped from hand labor to machine, and it was found that a brass rim behaved better under the heat. The January 1878 list of changes published approval of the Mark II revolver for cavalry and lancers. The Mark III was already allowed, but publication stalled until June, at which time the Mark II approval was canceled. Uh, and this is where things get interesting. Initial orders were small enough, but following Russia's growing success in the war, it was decided to, uh, to mass forces in Malta, just in case. This preparation generated a huge demand for the erstwhile unwanted Adams revolver. Unfortunately, having been weaned on a trickle, John Adams couldn't keep up with this sudden deluge. From prior episodes, we know the War Department was forced to buy from Colt and from Tranter to make up their deficiencies, taking what could have been sales for Adams if he had more stock on hand. Sadly, he was likely low because of A, the trickle, and sales to foreign powers in the years before. The Portuguese Navy officially adopted the Mark III to replace their own Beaumont Adams percussion pistol. A small lot was sent to Mexico for various trials. APSAC's advertising claims that there were further sales to Chile, Brazil, the Ottoman Empire, and China, though I'm unsure of any details on those lots. Despite all this effort, however, John Adams' sales were frankly slow. The War Department had been purchasing at a trickle. His commercial business was nibbled away by a myriad of more adaptable competitors who were not uh, heavily invested in their machinery designed to make exactly one kind of revolver. One noteworthy threat came from the now famous Webley, who built their revolvers around the 450 cartridge instead of around the previous service percussion revolver's frame. These were more compact and lighter, making them more popular with police and in civilian sales. For the past decade, John Adams had built his business to survive on minimal orders and then was suddenly sought out for half as much as he had ever made thus far with a timeline measured in months. It's almost a monkey's paw curse, nearly dying of thirst only to be drowned. Following the 1878 approval for army use, the Adams would see service throughout the empire. An issue of the revolver grew. Artillery drivers picked them up following the Second Anglo-Afghan War. Egypt saw them down to the farriers. More and more positions qualified for revolvers. However, their long neglect caused the British forces to learn hard lessons quickly that others had already discovered. Training was almost non-existent, making accidents very common, and frankly, this was generally blamed on the equipment more than the lack of any understanding of said equipment. Further problems were found in South Africa. Experience was showing that the 450 Adams cartridge was insufficient to truly stop a charging threat, and stories of officers found skewered by only a slightly subsequently deceased Zulu spread like wildfire. Whether this was really a matter of stopping power or a sign of poor accuracy through poor training is sadly impossible to know. The cartridge debate actually swirled in British journals, with many pointing to the sheer power of the American 45 Colt commercial cartridge. This was, of course, found to be unnecessarily punishing to use in rapid double action fire. So, as we know in hindsight, a compromise would eventually be made. A new cartridge was adopted in 1880, splitting the difference and hopefully meeting approval. It was not applied, however, to the Adams revolver. Instead, the War Department had quietly spent the past few years working on a terrifying chimera made up of the best features available. To be honest, I can hardly argue with each of their reasoned points, but the result is strange. The Enfield Mark I adopted in August of 1880, a revolver we've covered in detail before. One that immediately displaced the service Adams just two years after it was finally truly accepted in service. Back in June, however, John Adams had apparently seen the writing on the wall, selling his business over to his foreman, William Watts Locke, who had been with him since at least 1866. Adams Patent Small Arms Company now became the Adams Patent Small Arms Manufacturing Company. Some later Mark III's will appear with this replacement marking, many of them made from leftover Model 1866 frames. From here, the already mysterious John Adams all but disappears. There's some paperwork evidence from July of 1881, uh, more settling up of his former company, uh, which in his absence ceased to exist. Uh, where he went and what he did or even when he died are all unknown to me at this time. 
It's actually very frustrating. Locks App Samp started trading in other revolvers and sold the, the 391 strand business location in 1892, going out of business in 1894. Thanks to a myriad of small changes added to the Enfield revolver, at first advancing it to the Mark II, but then going even beyond that with two added hammer block safeties, production wasn't as rapid as had been hoped. So despite orders in 1880 for the Mark I and IV conversion Adams revolvers to be moved to Coast Guard duty, along with the Mark IIs on hand, they actually soldiered along for a few more years. All of John Adams revolvers were withdrawn from service in 1892, and in August of 1893, the list of changes declared them obsolete, though this was circulated afterwards in 1895. Colonial and police service carried on. The South Australian police were issued Mark III's during the 1890s. My Mark III here actually has their unit marking, SA and a broad arrow, plus a police inventory number marked on the top strap. These were only retired in 1910. New South Wales used them for prison guards, also into the 1890s, though some sources say longer. Adams revolvers also turn up with various South African markings, and we know from previous episodes the 450 Adams cartridge remained standard in various South African territories for years to come. While these revolvers were long gone before the Great War of 1914, there is a suggestion it might have seen limited use. There is a list of changes entry for 1921 declaring the Adams Mark III cartridge obsolete for land service. Small problem, we don't have evidence of when it was actually accepted, but it seems to have been World War I production 450 Adams ammunition, though that could equally apply to a number of Webleys and other pistols than just the Adams. Even more surprisingly, the Adams was issued as an emergency sidearm in World War II, and we know this one. Samples can be found marked with the broad arrow and double Ds of the Australian Department of Defense. These were reissued in 1941 or 42 and are unlikely to have seen combat. Still, that's damned impressive for an often overlooked Marshall revolver. The poor John Adams design has been, yes, intentionally all mixed up with Beaumont and Robert Adams who did indeed set the stage. Ultimately, however, it was a conservative pistol for an overly conservative army which suddenly changed its mind and went full bore into what they thought was the future, leaving poor Adams in the dust. If we put it in context, however, the Adams Mark II especially was ready in 1867. That's three years ahead of the frankly more antiquated looking Austrian gasser, six years ahead of the Colt single action army, or the more comparable French Chamlo Delvin, a decade ahead of the Nagant, and God help the Reich's revolver. It's interesting to realize how many countries had only just come around to the pinfire single action left a show as the Adams was entering the market. So despite its lack of simultaneous extraction or say a, a rebounding hammer, it was for a brief moment truly modern. It's just that it was a hectic time for handgun technology. All right, with all of this covered, let's get May's opinion on these John Adams revolvers. Once more, we've made room for May. Hello. And I have... Technically two revolvers, I just have a third one because we borrowed one from Tom. Yes. Um, <laughs> but we have an Adams Mark III, Adams Mark II. Unfortunately, yep. we couldn't get a Mark I or IV in our hands. A little difficult. The difference there would be it would be five shot. For the Mark I. Yes, for the Mark I or IV. Oh, okay. Because we can't so really tell the difference between a Mark I and IV yet. Oh, okay. We know theoretically what the difference is supposed to be, but then in actuality it looks like as usual. Okay. So. Well, that's fun. <laughs> Cool. Anyway, um, the Mark II is going to be our first start off. So sure. let's get that in your hands. Okay. This is, just to remind everybody, a new made six shot version of a conversion five shot mm -hmm. built on a percussion Beaumont Adams. Right. <laughs> From like the 1854. There's a lot of baggage with this guy, I see. It's, um, when you when you first look at that gun, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Uh, well, it's very British in just how it looks and how its sizes and just how awkward the features kind of right. clamor together. Now I will point something out to you. That doesn't look British. British looks like that. Oh, okay. So it's the other way around. The British <laughs> saw this and went, or something like this, and went, "Oh, we want that." The Adams eighteen fifty one starts this trend a little bit, but if you look at Adams eighteen fifty ones, they don't. Well, the early ones, they have. A weirder like grip. Boma Adams? No, just Adams. Oh. An Adams 1851 okay. double DAO, double oh, action okay. only. 
those guns have the solid frame. They have the metal work of what we think of as British. But the grip and sort of the backside are halfway there. I can kind of see that. The Beaumont Adams tends to refine this. And then everything goes off of that. Like for for many decades afterwards, everybody's copying the Beaumont Adams percussion revolver. Right. This is essentially a conversion, a center fire conversion of that revolver. Mm-hmm. So British looks like this, if that makes sense. Okay, that tracks. <laughs> so, well, can you tell so me anyway, some British things? It's large. Well, it's large and it's got a fair bit of heft to it. The grip feels very British esque in that it's got this kind of like banana ish taper to it right. and then it has a giant knuckle in the back. That's like one of their favorite things to do. Right, for double, it's a saw grip for double action. Sure. It's always in the wrong spot. Yeah, it really is. The hammer feels like you're having to reach. Up and almost like pry it up, like just nearly over center almost. Very but, short hammer spur. Yeah. And then uh, luckily, uh, the one thing that it's unlike with British is that it's very light hammer pull. Yeah. It's normally really heavy. And I went, oh man, both these hammers are really light. That's really kind of nice, actually. No, that's probably because it's an uncomplicated action. Okay. Um, Wait, uncomplicated? I thought there was like a ton of springs in here. Yeah, that's so. Oh boy, how do I put this? Later on, many revolvers would try to get springs to do two or three things at once. Yeah, it makes sense. It's have, less parts. Yeah, and... fewer springs. Yeah. Then this gun is the opposite. There's everything that has to move with bias has mm-hmm. its own separate flat or V-spring. Right. So, oh wait, so in that respect, it's also simple and it's complicated. You have no, you're not playing any game of trying to get a spring to put the right amount of pressure this way and the right amount of pressure that way. You're also not having springs that are getting double stacked by two parts moving at once. Mm-hmm. So in that regard, you can make it as light or heavy as you want. And okay. also for whatever reason, it seems that 450 Adams guns, the, the primers must not have been as hard as we expect from the US. Uh-huh. Um, because it seems like guns chambered in British 450 Adams don't have to beat the primers to death like we see in so many other military pistols of this time. I mean, that's kind of nice. It means that it's an easier time for me as the shooter. Right, so you had no problem cocking? Yeah, absolutely no issue there. Was surprised on actually both of them. I don't don't even have it on camera of you being surprised by how light it was. being like, oh, God, okay. Well, because (laughs) normally I just expect it because I see this, this grip angle and I see that hammer, that knuckle, and I think... Oh, God, it's all going to be a horrible thing to all together. No, this was a pleasant surprise. Who, who hurt you? The infield hurt me. <laughs> we all know it was the infield. The marks one and two. <laughs> Never forgot them. Never forgive. All right, anyway. Um, okay, so we have, like I said, large and a bit cumbersome. We have a side uh, ejector rod, which... I can get pretty quick with these, and I kind of like them in general just because it feels kind of natural just to easily grasp and go. This one is a little flimsy feeling in that it feels like it almost wants... It's not a parent style ejector rod, but it kind of has a similar sensation to me in some ways. It does. It kind of bothers me that you've done this side rod thing, but you haven't reinforced or supported it at all. It's just sort of attached. Yeah. I'm completely unsurprised that these rods... Bent and broke off all the time in they service. They did, didn't they? Yeah. And then it's got this like the mushroom backside to it that kind of wants to just kind of meet with a cylinder wall too easily. And just, I, don't, I didn't really find it very smooth to operate, unfortunately. No, and there's no spring assist in either direction. Spring assist would be great because that's where you get that rapidity back. And granted, no abity system, so I'd be manually having to rotate the cylinder, right. but still pretty quick with a spring assist. It has a very slight sensation of detenting. Mm-hmm. But there is no detent. And no. I only have one example, so I can't say that maybe there's not just a wang in it or something. Right. But, eh. And then gate loading. Um, I'm not familiar with that. However, it is unusual when the gate flips up. That's true. We haven't really had a lot of flip up gate loaders that I've experienced. So that was kind of different. Um, just making sure you got to line up. Because there is you can't roll back to then align the cylinder with the, with the detent that they have the here. The loading groove. Yeah, the loading groove. So it's a little wobbly in that respect, but I don't think I had too many issues as long as I held it down. No, but you have to guide it every time. There's, yes. There's no mechanical assist whatsoever. No, so like, I guess if it was a poor lighting or if I'm trying to do this quickly, it'd be a little awkward. I yeah. could see missing you, one back you can't get a, You can't get a synchronized rhythm. You know right. what I mean? Yeah. And that can make a difference for me. Um, the sights, you know, it's actually not bad for revolver sights. We have Especially a, in that era. Oh, yeah. We have a really tall, deep V-notch rear with a blade front. That's actually a pretty decent combination. It's really. also a driftable front. So in theory, you could have it staked for windage oh, right at the yeah, beginning. Oh, that is driftable. How about that? That's a fairly advanced feature. That's pretty good. Yeah. Solid plus point for the atoms then. And then trigger pulls. 
Yeah, they're pretty light, actually, <laughs> both times with both single and travel, double. Though? Oh man, how, how far you got to go? So that's the thing is that that is one thing I did notice is that because you can see it, there's a little sear sticking out right down there that you got to meet as you're pulling back through. And I don't think I can show the camera this. You know, it's just you have to go all the way back and basically meet the backside of this and whole trigger guard practically yeah, in order for it to work. By the time it releases, you're already kind of pulling against dead weight. And that's a really slow release on that trigger too. That wasn't me. That was, it's kind of dragging yeah, the a The return bit. stroke is long and it's got a lot of drag from the um, It's long and lets you strut. take your time with your shots. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, at least you know it reset because you got to let it go all the way. Yep, true. Oh, got to make sure I put in half cock if I want to rotate that cylinder. Um, and then I guess last but not least was recoil. Still pretty moderate on this guy, I would say. So um, explain that with me. Explain that if you would, because what were you expecting for recoil? It's a very heavy gun shooting 450 atoms. Yeah, that's I guess maybe what I was thinking was that maybe the weight of the gun would help bring down a little bit more of that recoil or it just fit with it better. But I guess maybe we've, we've shot other 450 atoms. So we've shot like the Webley RIC. Yeah. Um, we shot some medium sized guns in this cartridge. I believe uh, our number five Webley was in that cartridge. Mm -hmm. And then we also have shot little tiny Tranter, 1868. Oh, yeah, 68. That was super tiny. Yeah, which would have actually come out just the year after this gun. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Um, the thing is, you're probably expecting, oh, okay, that little tiny 450 Adams cartridge in this big gun. Right, I'm thinking that comparatively it's probably going to have a little more recoil mitigation with it, right. but actually really kind of didn't feel like it did. Well, your borax is fairly Still tall. Fairly, yeah. It's not outrageous. No. I mean, it's just fairly tall. If you really take it from the top knuckle, well, it's, that's, it's not that's that Well, that's if you're holding up that high with the knuckle. That's true, you are a little lower. Yeah, you're not quite, I'm. Well, you and me both won't crowd up on that high pitch knuckle. But with this much mass, I would expect almost nothing for recoil. And I still let my hand kind of rise with it. It's still it's still up there. Yeah. Do you um, any idea why you might have gotten the climb that we're, we're actually seeing in the video? Well, I I think it's probably to do with essentially we have the cartridge and it's not actually going to fill up this entire cylinder, correct? So right. it's basically going to have to travel a little the bullet's actually going to have to travel like there's actually going to be some force happening inside the cylinder itself, which means it's going to probably Increase the speed. There's more dwell. Is my thought. Yeah, there's on it. the bullet is spending longer with the charge, so the, the you're getting so there's more buildup. You're spending more time holding the charge in, right? Yes. Because the bullet has to travel just a little bit further. But even so, because it's going just a little bit further before we reach the uh, gap between the cylinder and the barrel, right? Then you have all that leakage of gas. That adds a significant velocity to 450 atoms in these guns that you didn't see. And the That's other, what I would think it would inherently do. Right, which is interesting because this is the gun that originally that that was developed for 450 atoms. So 450 atoms was expected to have a performance curve that matched this gun's muzzle velocity. But would that really impact the recoil? Yeah, it should. If you're throwing more power instead of just blowing powder yeah, out the sides, I guess that's true. You're burning more of the powder, right? Than if you had in the Webley, and so that's why you're getting more oomph. Now, to be honest with you, I feel bad. I should have chronoed this, but I hadn't thought about it when we were filming outdoors. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't until we were getting deeper in the episode that I noticed, wait a second, there's supposed to be an actual performance game here. Um, but it's maybe something we'll do as a side project later and just see what we get on the clock and how much actual difference we're seeing. Because we still have like an RIC with a little short, you know, chamber laying around. My only problem is I don't have anything with the same barrel length in a shorter chamber. And that would be the weird balance is trying oh, to get... Oh, that'd be curious to see, Yeah, yes. I mean, if somebody has like one of the odd... See, sometimes there's Mark threes that have like four or four and a half inch barrels, that'd probably be a better test gun. But it would be something to experiment with. Were the were the cylinders of the Mark One shorter? No, no, okay. the Mark One because that's the whole point is you're coming from the conversion of the percussion gun, right? So that's why they. That's are why I was so thinking long. maybe the cylinders would be different potentially. But... No, 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 because that's that's how they got that long. They would have um... never made a cylinder that long for a cartridge that short. Okay, that makes except sense. Except they took a percussion cylinder and then they loaded the the cartridge for the same charge that they expected to find in the percussion gun because that's what the frame could withstand. Okay. That but makes when more they sense did than the math on that, it came oh, up short. Wow, that totally makes sense. I thought this yeah. was more intentional, but no. It no, just no, no. kind of kept going. It was with a lucky it. accident that it ended up making it better performing. They're okay. like, oh, wow, okay. Happy actually, accident. That's... Cool. <laughs> there, anyway. Ooh, science. Yeah, so now tell Smith and Wesson they need to come out with like a 357 Magnum, which is a longer cylinder. Oh, yeah, the ridiculously gas. long cylinder. Everybody talks about gas seal, but really you could just have a longer cylinder. So, wait, if you had a longer cylinder, but like we had a tiny barrel, that still, would that be better? I mean, well, I mean, you're not going to get as much... Snubnoses have their own problems 
both in terms of precision and accuracy. So, <laughs> but velocity. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... It seems really funny in perspective, though. <laughs> May's become a gun designer. All right, that's the Mark II covers. Okay. Before we, I don't want to go too much detail um, in terms of impression yet, because we have the Mark III. Right. Which is extremely similar. Very much so. Can, can you walk us through your perceived differences? Well, I think if you were to put either one of them in my hands, and then, you know, my eyes are closed, then you open them, and I shoot them, then you hand me another one, eyes closed, open them, shoot, Perceivably, I do not think I could tell the difference between the Mark II and the Mark III. You shouldn't. It's the same barrel, same frame, same trigger, same. I mean, it's that's same because holding mechanism. it from the backside, I can't see that ejector rod. No, that's they're, the only difference. They're, they're identical, except for loading and unloading. And yeah, loading and unloading, because I mean, obviously, we have some indifference with the ejector rod, but also I can roll back to align with this with this uh, cartridge trowel trough <laughs> trough not it's a, trowel it's a loading groove but made it loading like that groove a, loading groove i've been trying to remember channel. that loading channel oh so good there you go <laughs> um but yeah that's that's really a the only major difference is the thing and i guess maybe i was i, I mean i guess the ejector rod slowly kind of wiggled out of this one as we were shooting it so that's bit. it's very strongly detented so even if your rod walks it shouldn't be able to pivot over like it's very odd Adam's initial, because this is the Adam's ejector, we see it in a lot of firearms. But in all the other firearms we see it in, it tends to be that the emphasis is put on retaining the rod in the arbor. On this one, there's almost no emphasis on retaining it in the, are you having fun? Well, I was just thinking for a second, because I remember complaining about the Mark II's ejector rod and that it kind of, it was a little bit snaggy and not quite stable. This one's actually, even though it, it snuck out a little bit right. from the arbor, it's very smooth. Well, it's probably because it hasn't been beaten on. So, but anyway, to get where I was saying, there's no retention on the rod in the arbor. Instead, the retention is on keeping the uh, arm that holds the rod mm -hmm. from being able to pivot. So if that rod backs out, it doesn't matter. It's not in the way. Right. It only needs to be in there when you're holstered so that it can't get bent. Mm -hmm. If you start firing and you fire it and it walks all the way out, well, you have to eject anyway. Or if right. you throw it in your holster, it's going to get compressed back in anyway. So who cares? Not a big deal. Now, the only thing was... What you don't want is to get in the path of the cylinder and jam the cylinder, which it can't do because of the detent. Right. It's just a different priority stack. Totally understand. And then I don't know if this is a wear part or not, but I did notice that this pin that's retaining the arbor in here actually sticks out a little further than I care for. If you don't push the ejector rod all the way over to the right, you can accidentally back yeah. up against that. Or if you flex on it a little bit too much trying to eject, I find yeah. that I snag it. When I handle it, I snag on that stupid pin all the time. I don't because I just, I over travel. I just know to push it a little bit further than what I feel is natural. Right. And that's it. That's all I have to do. No, what I don't know is actually, you know, we have, we borrowed another one. Oh, let's, oh, let's we have see. another one. Hold on. Science. No, it's nowhere near in the way. But I will say, yeah, this one very clearly has a wear mark where it's happened before. Uh -huh. And it's just gotten rubbed down. So this one's just been worn in. It got in. tommed. And even then, if I, if I pivot this a little too roughly, actually, Tom, your screw is loose. <laughs> if I oh no yeah I can if I'm not paying attention I can strike that pin it's like the worst position for they could have just flipped it they could have put the release pin on the other side and the screw on this side and it would have been fine but no they they just put it in the way so it's a little six and one half dozen the other I will say which one do you think would be well I'll ask which one do you think would be better about preventing the rod from getting bent um. Probably the Mark III, I would say, just because it really seems to protect it better, right. in my opinion, because the Mark II is just sticking out there. It's, this... it's completely exposed, and it's actually, if you were to drop this gun on its side, you could easily damage it that way because it's sticking out just far enough to the right. That's the problem. Whereas this one is underneath. Managing to hit this one just the right way, you'd have to have dinged up the trigger guard probably at that point. Right. I will say uh, the Mark II came to us in very good condition uh, mechanically. Mm -hmm. And yet the rod is... Blah, 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 right? Right. The Mark III came to us and I had to retime the firearm to be able to shoot it. You know, it has a lot of wear in it. It's mm -hmm. clearly lost a lot of finish. It was in service. The rod is tight. It's in great oh, shape. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. So, I mean, it's it's a sample size of two, but at least it gives us something to work off of. True. Now, overall, mm -hmm. how do you feel about the Adams in terms of uh, being a big board black powder uh, offensive or defensive revolver? Well, let's think about this for a second. Um, we talked about this earlier. 
The Tranter, 1868, comes out, what, a year after this guy? Yes, that's the hard part to realize. Whenever we think about British service for these, most of them were really only... The demand for the revolver only appears around 78. Mm -hmm. When this has been out for over a decade. Right. And that's kind of hard to picture because that's we tend to think of these as being late 70s guns. And this is a double and single action revolver. A lockwork inherited from the 50s. Right. So, so the real key is that it's center fire. Now, I think the 67, it has some growing room. Mm -hmm. That would be the Mark II. Yep. But by 72, that feels pretty well fleshed yeah, out, especially that's... being able to backspin and load correctly. Oh, yeah. I think that's actually inherently, it, it's got a lot of technological advances that I right. wish others had had that were already out. Right. Or that were coming, that hadn't come out yet. I mean, shoot, Ed, if the, the Germans couldn't get a hold of themselves with the 1879. Nine, right. No, I I actually believe that the Adams might be the best revolver available for the late 1860s, early 1870s. Mm -hmm. Until you start to see the Shamlo Delvines appear and others like that, which I believe just meet the expectations of the Adams. I don't know that they're exceeding the expectations of the Adams because mm -hmm. Adams 1872 punchback is very strong contender. Um, now, what about the the Warnens, like the seventy eight? Well, so that gets interesting. I'm actually we've got a we've got our Fanu yeah. design on our my T shirt right uh -huh. now. That's eighteen seventy four patent date, right? Which means just two years after the Mark III, what is the lockwork for the modern revolver exists in the world, mm -hmm. but it takes like a decade for even the beginnings of people to notice, right? And then two decades before it really starts to find itself into military service. It just Nobody knows it's there, and then they slowly discover it through this sort of osmosis process. Mm -hmm. So it's weird to imagine that you have a technology that sat around from the 1850s and barely got implemented in Britain by the late 1870s. Right. And yet the solution for what's going to be the future revolvers is already in existence. Yeah, it's just it, it's right. so under the rug that no one has kind of picked up on it yet. Yeah, it until you pick up the rug that you go, oh, it's been there this whole time. Yeah, and they were shown elements of it because they end up with a warnant style lock work in this guy, which is a cousin. Right. But they just couldn't make it work right. You mm -hmm. know, the, the Enfields, we have a whole episode on these guys, but they came out really weird. Um, anyway, let me let me put it to you this way then. You've already praised it for its design in the 1860s. This is true. It actually ends up coming into competition with the guns that immediately bump it out of the market, right? Um, the first two competitors to it mm -hmm. are the Tranter 1878 right. and the Colt 1878, which we've covered both of those. Yes. How would you rate it against those guns? Thinking back on the, uh, the Tranter 1878, I... I realistically had one big concern that actually made it a, a, a pretty substantial one, in my opinion, was that that ejector rod just kind of fell. And then I was really concerned it was going to fall in the way of the action. It looks yeah, like it once, essentially could back up a little once bit. Once it's spring latch let go, it could get in the action. Right. You're not going to have that with the Mark III specifically. No, I guess not. And um, then otherwise, did you find it any way remarkable above and beyond the Mark III? I mean, the action, I think, technically is, is slightly less springs involved with it. But I honestly, I find it kind of just very comparable to no, the Adams. Internally, externally, solid frame, too many springs, you know. Always too many springs. Manual rebounders, gate loaders. When you're comparing the Adams Mark III and the Tranter 1878, I'm not seeing enough difference to really warrant going one way or the other, other right. than, again, that distrust for the ejector rod. So then the other question is the Colt 1878. Mm. Would you pick that over the Adams? God, you know what? I probably would. <laughs> I know, uh, we keep coming back to this. May technically likes the Colt 1878. She just doesn't want to admit I it. Did, I did not. But then when you compare it to the others, that you just inherently the action's more solid. So Sort of. I, I don't know that it's more solid. I think it's just... More polished, and then the, I think that's it. It just it feels cleaner, and it does feel better overall. Yeah, and then the shrouded ejector rod worked very. You love oh, the ejector. Oh yeah, that rod, was great. Which is just a Colt eighteen seventy three ejector. That's really all it is. Yeah, yeah. So, the, the if you had to choose between the two to, to purchase, mm -hmm. which one would you pick in eighteen seventy eight? The Adams Mark three or the Colt? Probably the Colt. It sounds like a narrow band, though. I mean, it's it's still pretty close. Like, it's not like amazingly more it, inherently better than I think the uh, Adams. However, I think it just marginally beats it out. The, this is interesting because the Colt has kind of a worse trigger in terms of weight. It does have a worse trigger, but you can at least reduce that a little bit if you back out you, that front yeah, you screw could on the dial back it strap. In. 
On the um, strap. So you have a worse trigger. You have a more complicated mechanism that is liable to break down, but overall the gun has better polish and fit and finish. It's also a much more standardized production, so your parts interchangeability is, hi interchangeability is higher than on the Adams. Less hand fitting. Yes. However, the Adams is lighter triggered, lighter hammered, mm -hmm. and you performed pretty well with the Adams. I did. So when we're talking about a revolver that was, and again, I think I mentioned this, but Von Oppen targeted the Adams Mark III. Mm -hmm. the, the whole point of the Colt 1878 was to be superior to the Adams Mark III. And yet, it's close enough that we're sitting here going, ooh, I don't know. Yeah. And that is a gun that is, you know, what, six years after mm -hmm. the Mark III and a decade after the Mark II. Right. That tells you that despite the fact that when we look back, this is a gun that came to its prominence too late. Mm -hmm. And it was actually ahead of the curve. So I just... I, I kind of like it. It's very close calls, and I wouldn't fault anybody for going one way or the other at that point. Now, here's the really weird one. So this gets replaced with the ideal revolver in 1880, which we have a whole episode on these Enfields. Mm -hmm. Who do you pick between an Enfield or an Adams Mark III? Well, I can't see myself ever picking the Enfield. Because the, the bit... So, like, rapid I, extraction... It, I can't argue. Well, now hold on. Not necessarily rapid extraction yeah. because we we do have one case that right, does right, a tie right. up at the six o'clock position. And then theoretically, same gate loading. Okay, right. fine. But you know, technologically, you're talking about a worn in auto rebounding, uh, break open, auto extracting revolver. Right. This should sound better. Oh, and by the way, and side plate easily cleaned and serviced. Mm -hmm. Fixed frame, interchangeable parts, not interchangeable parts. You know what I mean? All these differences right. should stack up to a clear winner. I mean, for my hand size, it really just does not work out. Not only that, but your trigger is brutal. Your it single is action brutal. is also uh, brutal. Right. And then overall, it just it it's not a comfortable hold. No. So I I kind of I you didn't even tell me this. I just know from watching the shooting footage. Mm -hmm. You would go with that, wouldn't you? It'd be a little, it'd be easier to use, yeah. This has a better cartridge. This has the Mark II Enfield cartridge. Mm -hmm. What are you picking? I mean, I, I still go with the. I've. Yeah. It's still, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I, it, the Adams is actually better in my mind than the gun that replaced it. Which, which by is the way, crazy. well, the Enfield was a failure. It, it was a failed design. Right. But that's wild, and so it takes all the way until this. To truly displace and that. That was pretty slick. Now this is an 1886 Webley. Mm -hmm. So this is pre-military adoption and it actually does have a different lock work and some differences inside that from what you're thinking of as a Mark I Webley. Right. And we're going to hopefully get to cover that someday soon. But this is where you finally distinctly move on from that. Yes. Now technologically they tried to distinctly move on mm -hmm. but it was a miss. So you're talking about 1867 all the way to 1886 in the British sphere. Now we know from my shirt that 1874 74. is really when a things prime year. should have been fixed. But yeah, <laughs> things should have been so much should have been different as of that year. But no, yeah. they it, it just stayed under the rug for so long and eventually came up to the surface where people were, oh wait we could use this. To be fair, it does a lot better when it starts being combined with rapid extraction systems like swing out cylinders and uh, top brakes. Right. Because the Fonu finds its way into the later Webleys and it finds its way into every European revolver practically. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's very interesting how overlapped revolver history is and how much it suffered from being adopted. And I will say, final thought, I think the Adam story is a microcosm of the revolver as a whole. Mm -hmm. Because by the time the revolver reaches full maturity and people accept it. Yes. The technology had been there for decades, mm -hmm. but it finally gets accepted. And then you wait five, ten years, semi-automatic pistols finally find their feet oh, yeah. and start running. And so the revolvers could have been great right at, right after the American Civil War. Mm -hmm. But nobody, everybody dawdled. They didn't understand what was in their hands. Right. And by the time they understood it, they had gone, oh, wait, that, that's cool, too. And semi-automatics were there. And, and they, that's shiny. Let me go over there. Yeah. It's kind of remarkable how little time there is for revolver preeminence but here they are and people still yeah. talk about them because they captured the imagination they were still in service because they were there and they were available and they were in a cartridge <laughs> that was still being produced yeah so overall i i kind of have an affection for the atoms even though it's probably one of the most forgotten now 
we'll probably get to go back in time and get to work on the 1851 and the Beaumont Adams some other day. Yep. But on this episode, we just skip right to the finish as best we could. Fair. Do we have any um, executive producers for this episode? We do. We have a second one that's going out to Jeff, too. Uh, yeah. That was, again, a donation aspect, not a um, financial aspect, but still yep. it counts. Um, we have a couple other execs that are actually hanging out mm -hmm. because they're waiting for very specific episodes. Okay. So if you're one of those guys and you just get tired of waiting, let me know. We can put you in wherever. Was there another guy that was interested in the British one specifically? Yes. Um, for this episode and any British episode, I really want to make sure that we say thanks to Andy Wade. Yes, thank you. Because he's given us a huge help, especially getting through last year. Mm -hmm. So we want to make sure that we appreciate him whenever we talk about his favorite topic. Oh, yes. So Ho thank you, Jeff, too, and thank you, Andy. Hopefully this met your approval. I hope so. Anyway. All right. All right, I think that's got us wrapped up. Yeah. So uh, join us over on Patreon Utreon if you want to hear our... Um, Patreon player. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, it's changed names to player now. Uh, if you want to hear us talk about making the show and what goes into all of this... Yep, uh, we, we have, have our bi-weekly podcast, bi-monthly, bi-weekly. Yes. If you're a non-patron, the same day generally, it might lag a little bit, but generally whenever an episode releases, the patrons already saw it the week before. Yep. So they get the release of the behind the scenes talking about, oh, this is what we've been doing this week and this is how, And you this know, is the episode. It's mostly just come. me pulling my hair out slowly. <laughs> they so. get the behind the scenes of pulling the hair perspective. <laughs> anyway, all right, well, you guys have a good one. Night, everybody. <laughs> South American history is riddled with intrigue in terms of kickbacks and, and BS. And it's very interesting to me because it's so obvious on the surface. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the U.S. and other countries, we also have corruption and kickbacks and things like that. This is, this is the standard, you know? Yeah. However, it's usually hidden better and it also is often beat out by national pride. Mm -hmm. In the case of South America, it's very weird. Like the, the incentives get twisted and turned all over the place. Huh. And it's just so strange. Okay. But generally for rifles, it seems like once the Mauser came on the scene, it was sort of undeniably better. Mm hmm And they kind of had to, oh, okay, we're actually doing this. Right. And it be, it, it, Mauser's most interesting effect was being able to beat out corruption mm -hmm. to a certain degree. They still played into it. Don't get me wrong. Lova was all involved in the corruption. But the, you yeah. know what they're going to do. They're going yeah, to take, take the truck. truck. Right. So they take them out to the barn and the the son, uh, Bertrand's father, is just like, oh, yeah, I can show it to you. And he's like, it's over here. Or no, wait, I think it was the son got, it was his father who got drafted. The grandfather showed him. He's like, yeah, I'll show you my son's truck. Okay. So he takes them out there. And he's like, this is the truck. And they're like, oh, it looks very nice. And he's like, yeah. And he's like, would you like to start it up? Please feel free. Like, here's the key. It's not working. He's like, well, that's weird. I know he drove it in here and I parked it and did all this blah, blah, blah. And he's like, well, they're like, can we open the hood? And he's like, oh, absolutely. Definitely. Yeah. He goes to pop it for him. They're like, where's the engine? He went, oh my goodness, I don't know. You know, you're not the first Germans that have come through. There's been some <laughs> thefts. I don't know. We could ask my son. Oh, wait, my son's a prisoner of war in Germany. And he just <laughs> looks at them. And the soldiers are just like, ooh. Uh, well, I mean, and they're like, they're, he's like, do you know what camp he's at? We could go ask him at the camp. And they're like, oh, we don't, we don't know what camp he's at, sir. But they are kind of fun. Yeah, they're fun to scoot around on. They're fun to... Honestly, when you're just going from A to B, like you and I have been doing so many errands lately, it has just made that pleasant. So that's the big triple action solid frame revolver, which represents a distinct and deliberate step backwards in technology. Why? Well, we'll cover that after we get a closer look in the light box. With an overall length of 11 inches, this is a fairly hefty revolver at 2.4 pounds. That is, of course, because it is a solid and rugged...